Welcome to the Meltzone Podcast. This is episode 70. I'm Tom. And I'm Stefan. And on today's episode, we have a very special guest. We have Scott Latain here from Marlin Firmware. Say hello, Scott. Hey, guys. How's everyone doing? Doing good. That, that was that was not the intro that, that we planned out, but <laughs> this episode is going to be a bit more off the cuffs. Um, so for those of you watching, listening, we're not going to do the usual structure where we chat and then do news and then do comments. Uh, instead, this is going to be more of an interview sort of back and forth uh, with Scott, who is the custodian, I think is the, the self-proclaimed title of the Marlin Firmer. That's correct, right? Sure. Custodian, curator, caretaker, victim, whatever you prefer. <laughs> yeah. So Marlin, of course, has been the, the firmware with a firmware base for hundreds of thousands of printers. Do, do, you, do you know how many printers you run your software at this point? Uh, I could only guess. I mean, it's like all, all those enders and, um, and you know, so many Chinese printers. So uh, and then uh, Lulzbot and early, early on Prusa and you could say that uh, the soul of Marlin is still in Prusa firmware even today. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of uh, um, machines besides 3D printers that also use it, including PancakeBot over here uh, mm -hmm. uses it as well. So, yeah, you can cook with it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm actually currently building um, a, a, a heat chamber for temperature testing running Marlin because... Yeah. It can yeah, control heaters. People, it has PID tuning. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing. I mean, it's like anytime you want to combine a nice, you know, menu interface and mm -hmm. then be able to do heat control and motion or and or motion control. We built yeah. pen plotters and other things with it as well. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's just it's very versatile. It's crazy. I would actually say it's running on definitely a million machines. Just just think about how many Prusas are in the wild. And how many Endo threes yeah. are have been sold per Prusa? So, I would wow. say those are a couple of millions. Well, yeah. So I'd say just everyone who has Marlin on their machine, um, send me a dollar, and I'll record your <laughs> name on a list, <laughs> and we'll find out just how many are running Marlin. Yeah. You, you just check your bank account, uh, you, you, your balance at the end of the month, and <laughs> we'll have a very definitive number. Just a dollar. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> which <laughs> from each user of Marlin? Yeah, which which wouldn't be that bad. I mean, for for a machine, you pay I don't know two hundred, three hundred bucks for, it, more or less. Yeah, I mean that's that's the really cool part is how it's how easy it is to get them now. I just love that. Yeah. So for for you, maintaining Marlin is basically a full time job, right? Oh yeah. Uh, I wake up every day uh, thinking about Marlin, and I go to sleep trying not to think about Marlin. Uh, and it's just, uh, every, every moment of every day is like, what can I do next? What's, what's on the list? What have I forgotten? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's, it's a blessing and the curse of, of being self-employed. I mean, Stefan and me, we, we know that too. Like you can, you can choose how much you want to work on stuff. And usually it is way more than, than you would work on, on your project. Uh, it is way more than you would work in a job, uh, that you end oh, up yeah. working on, on your projects. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, it's very much all consuming. I mean, I, there's always something going on that, uh, you know, and 10 more new things every day come up that are either requests or, you know, minor quibbles or big, you know, sometimes there's bigger problems, hopefully not too many. Uh, but yeah, it's constantly just constantly going on. It's crazy. Yeah. You're doing, you're doing the development work, um, but you're also doing stuff like this. You're, you're recording a podcast with us. With us, uh, so thank you for finding that time. Uh, you're yeah. on. You're on trade show. Well, trade shows. You're on community gatherings. Uh, you've you've been um, wherever I've seen you at Earth, right? Yeah. Uh, you, last time we saw each other was at Earth uh, last year. Briefly, and, uh, briefly walked past. That was such a such a packed event. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, you packed it for inc yourself. True. Insane. <laughs> that was a really great event. I had a lot of fun yeah. there. Yeah. I, I think I haven't seen you since Murph 2019. Or have, you, have you been to Murph last year? Uh, no, I haven't been to a Murph in a long time. I went to the yeah. first, uh, well, the first two for me were, I guess, 20, 
I don't know, when was it? 2016? Mm -hmm. I don't know, 17? But uh, yeah, I, I would love to go in to Murph because that's always the most, uh, it always feels like coming home, you know. Other events seem a little more commercial, but Murph always feels like we're just hanging out with people who love to do 3D printing and hacking and, <laughs> and you know, DIY and stuff. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, neither neither of us have been to Murph this year, and I'm not even sure. Do you know if Joel was there? Us, oh, the really other. Know. Yeah, not that many. Yeah, I. It's 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 a blessing and a curse that more of these shows are are happening, and you can't go to to each of them. But it's always nice to be there, and just I think the the. I wouldn't call it spirit, but the feeling a bit chaotic and unorganized at Murph just feels like home. If I'm looking around, like my 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 studio, my office right here, it's just all, all a mess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for yeah. the for the recording, I've got the nice tight yeah. shot on a, on a separate camera. What you two are seeing right now is is the, ah. the unedited wide angle because I needed some extra webcam. So yeah, we oh, okay. we're definitely very <laughs> similar there. Yeah, this works. Just so that, that I don't your, forget. Uh, <laughs> hit me up with your your open source. I guess the whole point of this is right. to really kind of follow up on your video about uh, how open source is not necessarily working for everyone, and uh, there are, qu are quibbles with it, and maybe even bigger problems with it. And we should, uh, I don't know, look at what is going on and why maybe there is this issue coming up now. Uh, I'm curious to know yeah, and understand so it myself. So basically, basically, my motivation for making that video was um, that I didn't want to be the one who who sort of I'm, I'm sorry, I should stop fidgeting. Um, that I didn't want to be the the one uh, who was sort of bullying or pushing people into making decisions that were not going to be sustainable for them. Um, sure. Basically, you know, be it, be it, uh, Prusa, be it you, um, be it um, rep rep firmer with do it. Uh, be it other manufacturers, printer manufacturers who publish their work. I didn't want to be the one who said like, hey, yeah, you have to keep doing this. And then in three years, we're going to see, um, you know, what, what, what are the companies that went out of business? Um, I, I keep bringing up Lothbot. Yes, they didn't go out of business. They were merged into another company. Um, the uh, GMAX, what are they called? Um, I don't know how. Oh, G Create three D. G Create, yeah. yeah. I don't know how how tight they were on open source, but um, yeah, they were very devoted to Marlin, but there wasn't a lot of interchange between them and our project. So I, I guess they were just using what we were putting out. Yeah, um, but it's it's this. I'm, I'm I'm sort of seeing this trend where where companies who are committed to sharing stuff, um, maybe get a pat on the back every now and then. But people end up buying the cheaper stuff that just takes that that work and puts it in their product, and it's like, thank you for the head start. Yeah. Work. Yeah, I I don't want to keep ragging on Bamboo because there's a very there's a crowd that likes those printers very much, um, but they're they're sort of the the, the prime example for that. Um, you've got Prusa yeah. Slicer, you've got Clipper. Yeah. I I mean I don't know if they run Clipper, but they're certainly taking the learnings from Clipper. And they can certainly get a head start on how they should implement their own firmware input shaping, etc. Um, and yeah, yeah. There's just some question as to whether uh, what Bamboo is doing, because uh, it's very hard to just write a firmware from scratch. But it, I yes. mean, it's certainly possible. They, but I imagine they must have taken some something as a starting point. I don't know what exactly. Uh, so it'd be interesting to find out more about that. But it's, you know, being being that it's closed, it's like you have to do a little sleuthing in forensics to figure it out. But of course, they've definitely pushed us to be more inspired to try and get our printing faster and to get those first layers right yeah. the first time. Not that bamboo printers never screw up. They do. And sometimes the complexity is one of the reasons that they screw up more. Uh, than they than they might otherwise. So it's you know there are trade offs. It's like you're, there is no perfect world where you know you can just press a button and your print is very much guaranteed to come out with no spaghetti and no layer shifting and no problems. Uh, everything comes with you know little. There's always mechanical issues that yeah. you can't anticipate. 
I mean, their extruders kind of sometimes fall apart, apparently. The cover comes off or something, so they've got to, you know, they've always got things to work out. But they're definitely, uh, you know, just the fact that you can get printing so fast out of them and they do materials really well. They've got the really nice high flow hot end that is compact. And I mean, they're just doing some impressive engineering. Yeah. And so that's in, that's inspiring to all of us. On on top of that, that the fact that they were like this is their first product, uh, the X One Carbon, just out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the printer yeah. that they put out. That is that is the most impressive thing about all of that. Yeah, they're here in Austin. I really love a tour. <laughs> I'd love to go and see what they're doing, and uh, you know, meet their meet their engineers. But I, I understand that they're uh, they're also very much based in China, so it's sort of a there's an interchange there uh, that helps them keep the cost down while uh, still being headquartered here in Austin. So I'd like to find out more about all of Are they all, really headquartered they in do. Austin or is it just like a facility uh, for standing out stuff and stuff and doing a couple of repairs? Yeah, I mean, the photographs I've seen show lots okay. of bamboos in a big old room in Austin that aren't packed <laughs> in boxes. So I don't know what they're doing exactly, but maybe it's just the final construction or the final testing happens here or something like that. Um, you know, maybe they're shipped uh, unassembled and they get assembled here. I'm not really sure altogether. So that's part of what I'd like to find out. But yeah. uh, but they're, they're definitely pushing things. And um, on the other side, you have Clipper, which is another thing that's uh, emergent and is definitely inspiring. And a lot of uh, printers are now starting to use that, like the Creality K1, which is sort of meant to be a low pr lower priced competitor or similar priced competitor to Bamboo's P1P. Yeah, um, absolutely. But a little more polished than the P1P. Uh, and I guess they're meeting a, get a bit them. of, uh, a, they're getting a little blowback because they used Clipper, but then they, they closed it up and made it really hard to work, uh, modify and kind of hid the fact that it was Clipper and took the branding off, which is always a little annoying. Yeah. They should keep their, you know, they should be able, they should be proud of the fact that they're, and announce what they're using, but then, you know, also add their name to it and say, you know, this is our customized version of it and these are our tuned profiles or configurations or whatever. Um, you know, that help, that definitely helps for uh, people to know, you know, and have some perspective on what they're using, which is, I think, important. I guess it, it puts a manufacturer into a better light when they can claim, hey, this is our work. This is what we developed and it's our skill that we, we put in and we made this thing that works just as good as Clipper. Um, of course, when when it comes out that it, hey, it is actually Clipper. It's it's not something they they did. That might give a bit, bit of backlash. But the thing is, people buying the printers, they maybe don't care as much as as we do. Um, sure. It's you know at the end of the day, it's like hey, one person buying a thing, getting a, a good deal on it. I yeah. I I can't blame yeah. it for making that decision. Right. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the user cares about the user experience, whether it's reliable or not, what they, you know, uh, and then, of course, initially, what, what they can get for a good price. And and then, you know, over time, there's going to be the experience that they have dealing with whatever problems they do have, dealing with the customer service, whether they can get a response and, you know, whether that experience is good. And a lot of companies are using either Twitter and or Discord as their kind of customer service these days, which is interesting. But that sort of does bring them closer together with their customers in a way. They can get more immediate responses. So I don't have necessarily a problem with that. Right. So it's, yeah, it's very interesting to see how the model is kind of evolving over time for that. But definitely from the user perspective, like, yeah, we, you, as you've said, you've uh, mention things whether someone is compliant or not compliant, and then uh, the people who watch your videos will, and who also comment, will comment uh, maybe mostly in the we don't care category. Uh, but then you do get a few responses that are like, yeah, I only buy open source, or I'm always glad to see that something is using open source yeah. uh, and supporting that. Um, and ultimately, you know, whether somebody uses open source or supports it is kind of different questions. Because they may use it, but then they don't really support it in the in the more material way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, so that 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 would have been my my next question, of course, because you you publish stuff that is free open source software. Um, right. Yeah. Free, both as in the the typical you know uh, distinction between free as in beer, which is you don't pay for the software, and free as in freedom. Um, basically, you can take the source code, you can modify, do whatever you want with it. Uh, right. How 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 do you make that work? 
Well, uh, I mean, for the the freedom part, uh, it's a little tricky to like force compliance, as it were. Uh, in general, most everyone who uses Marlin is res- respectful of the license. And actually, you know, even though they may be slow sometimes to get their uh, their release, the source code out to like GitHub or someplace, I mean, they're really only obligated to provide it to customers who demand it. Uh, but True. it's always easier if they just put it up on GitHub or someplace. Uh, but that's getting better, actually. Uh, Creality is often like way ahead of uh, where I expect them to be uh, putting out firmware. And sometimes they'll have three firmware updates posted to GitHub before I realize it. And I'm like still trying to incorporate their work from three three releases ago. Uh, so they're getting better with it. Um, yeah, and, and that's, uh, that's how it as well. should work, right? Where um, you put out a firmware and then somebody else does some modifications, changes stuff um, to make it work for yeah. their platform. And you can then roll those, um, you can pull those changes back into your mainline Marlin firmware and everyone profits off of it. That's yeah. how it should work. Uh, yeah, and that's really about supporting, like if they add a new LCD controller, then we want to be able to have someone use that same LCD controller, pull it off that printer and put it on a different one, for example. So it's nice if we can get just a, a config option that says, yes, this controller, and then you can just set that for whatever board you happen to be using um, and then mix and match your hardware. But ultimately, like there, it's like in a way almost not important for us to pull in every fork of Marlin that's out there because the intent is it's a starting point and you can modify it to your heart's content. And some vendors might want to modify it, like rip out everything except for the stuff that supports their machine, pull out all the Delta code and they could do that yeah, if it makes it easier for them to work the, with the it. That's the way, right? Um, they've, yeah, that's they've trimmed down Marlin so much that it works on their 8-bit controllers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've done that myself and it's almost it's almost trivial because you can just find the, <clears> the <throat> config option name and the block that it's in and just pull out every line between those, you know, if thens and else's yeah. and uh and then just have the the bare code that you need to support your machine. The difficult part then becomes that they can no longer easily contribute back to the mainline project without redoing their work on a separate code base. So it's like We'd rather that people use mainline Marlin and then make modifications to it, but in a way that makes it easier for that contribution to come back to the mainline. Uh, and that that and it also supports them because as we put out new updates, then they can just pull down the latest one and yeah. it'll already support their machine. They don't have to pull it down and then reapply their changes to a whole new code base. Yeah. And with the next version, there's going to be a lot of changes, so it's going to make things uh, particularly difficult if that's the way they want to keep going. So, uh, yeah, I'm trying to modernize the code base all the time and sort of standardize it. And that means doing a lot of like global search and replace and that kind of thing. And all that, all those hours of work are, you know, I hate to see that become duplicated effort uh, on the part of vendors, but, you know, it needs to be done. Unfortunately, we need to break a few eggs if we want to make progress on this thing. So there's that. Um, and, and in fact, you know, materially speaking, how does that work? Um, I'm well supported actually right now by Prusa is one of my largest contributors. Um, Big Tree Tech is, has come back into the fold. They were uh, accidentally knocked off contributions for a while, but they're back um, at the same level as Prusa, which is great. Uh, Creality donates uh, half as much as each of them. And, um, and Lulzbot has kicked in again. They were one of the earliest contributors and were... Uh, they're at the early on, and now they're back as well, since they've re- reconstructed their company. And uh, and then there's you know lots of individual users and smaller users. Um, uh, companies like TH3D have uh, you know when they've had when they've been in better financial straits, they've been supportive, and they're planning to come back and support us when they get more back on uh, more uh, back on their feet as well. Uh, and in general, like, yeah, there's a lot of small contributions from everyday users, which really helps a lot. And so it's, I'm able to do this work full time and pay for my rent and buy food and give out rewards for certain features when and uh, and con- and the best contributors uh, around Christmas time. Uh, I, I gave out a lot of rewards, especially for like the input shaping uh, feature and for uh, guys who've been there just keeping an eye on issues and and making sure that I know about the, the most important ones and things like that. 
So yeah, it's uh, it it works as long as uh, you know, as long as we all work together to kind of like contribute to the main project, then it it ends up benefiting everyone on a certain level. But you know, and and in general, like even if a company is like feeling fearful, like that their new great code that they contribute to Marlin might get used by somebody else. I think that's less of an important aspect than whether or not they produce a good product and whether they do good customer service and what the user experience is overall, you know, with that particular thing. Because there are, there are great versions of Marlin out there. And then there are some printers that like the Crowdy, I'll just name one, <laughs> Crowdy, who is a great supporter. I don't mind giving them some some slack, uh, some flack once in a while. The uh, Ender 5 S1 inter user interface is pretty bad. Um, on, although it's right and their version of Marlin was very well tuned. So like, you know, I'd like to make that better, but with the pile of stuff that I have to do, it's, it's somewhat tricky to do that. So it's like, I don't know if we, if we had more close collaboration with them on things like that, we could have things like you could actually go into subfolders on the Crowdy, uh, Ender 5 S1, which is something Marlin does, but that one particular printer just doesn't, yeah. uh, it only lets you use you know, files at the root, which is, and then it treats full, it makes folders look like files, which is, you know, obviously a mistake. So yeah, things like that, like just getting a good experience. It's like, it comes down to how much work they're willing to put in. And, and if they do work with us, you know, they, they end up with something better and they don't have to necessarily, you know, put in as much time and effort uh, when they want to do their upgrades and stuff. So, or even new machines, frankly. And now that we have things like input shaping, um, you know, they can, take advantage of like the latest version and suddenly their old printer, which maybe only could achieve certain speeds can now achieve higher speeds, you know, assuming that the, the hardware can handle it. So yeah, it's just uh, like everybody benefits uh, as we all advance in our technology. And, you know, so I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, not only will companies come along and, you know, throw us a few dollars if they're, basing their company around Marlin, but also they'll actually get more involved and collaborate with us a bit more so that we have the best upgraded firmware for them in the future as well. I've got two questions right here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe the first one. So, so even if others want to want to support you, your usual revenue streams are coming from Patreon and GitHub contributions or yeah, those are the main ones. Uh, there are some direct PayPal contributors, but it's mostly okay. Patreon and and uh, and GitHub are about equal half and half right now. Okay. The other one was if if you're looking at your working hours, how much of your time are you spending in um, just working on pull requests? How much is the work on new features? How much is supporting users and stuff like that? Um, it's it's always hard for me to tell how much work is it for you to get new things into Marlin and how much work is just maintaining the project itself. Yeah, um, well, that's that's a, a good one. Uh, let's see, I'd say I probably spend about a third of my time on, on direct support of just going into like Discord and disc, uh, helping users with their issues. And sometimes that leads to finding a you know, that there's some usability issue or a bug that needs to be addressed. And so that's useful for me in that way. Uh, Sometimes, uh, let's see, and then we get pull requests, which are, you know, contributions of oftentimes, you know, uh, all the code that comes into supporting a new printer uh, will come in as a pull request. And then I have to go and clean that up. And that often takes a lot of time uh, because I'm a stickler for making sure all the formatting is right and that they're using the right functions and following the latest way we do things as that is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, I do spend a lot of time on pull requests. And then uh, then there's just like modernizing the code base, which is another thing I'm trying to do. So for example, I'm separating the LCD pins out from the board pins so that we can have, and then there's adapters in between. So you have so I'm adding all that layer so that we can have any board work with any display as long as you have an adapter. Usually the adapter is just connect a wire from the board to the display if that display was made for it. But then you have cases like the maker-based boards have their 
plug keyed backwards. So you need an adapter, which basically is your your plugs are backwards between the board and the display. Uh, and then you know there's others where you actually have to have you know a two to one to uh, thingy adapter or a or a pin twenty eight adapter or whatever. So yeah, there's some all that. So that's one thing that I'm modernizing. And or, you know, just cleaning up the code base, turning things that used to be functions into classes and, you know, trying to break out things into a more uh, modern way of doing things. Marlin is very, very much metaprogramming based, so lots of macros. So I'm moving on to more metaprogramming with templates instead mm -hmm. uh, and, and adding things like I just added a string class so we can, you know, more easily concatenate strings without a bunch of sprintf and stir copy functions and things like that. So yeah, a lot of that work is, and then there's uh, building tools. So there's like auto build Marlin, which is a thing that's built in Electron within VS code. And so I have to build that in HTML and CSS and JavaScript. And that's a whole other level of things and trying to make tools that hopefully will help make configuration and migration easier in the future. And then there's documentation, building the Marlin firmware website in Jekyll, which is HTML, CSS, and then like meta code inside the inside of Markdown and other stuff. And and then that's then there's YAML as well. So I'm trying to like move all the configuration options from this big page we built in HTML and Markdown into YAML so that we can more easily include it like in a searchable way. And yeah, there's all that kind of stuff. And so it's just, you know all these different levels of things that need to be worked on. And a lot of it does fall to me because I'm the only one who sort of has everything in mind as far as how everything interacts and interconnects. Um, so yeah, it's like uh, between all of those things, like, I don't know, percentage wise, probably I'd say at least 60% of my time is spent on just code and code related stuff, maybe 20% of my time is spent on support and the Facebook group and discord. And then some 10% of my time goes into like documentation and mm -hmm. like code upgrading and things like that. And then, and then actually having time to go, get out a machine and run Marlin on it and test things. Like if I have a, an issue that I really want to tackle, that's when I'll get out the machine and really get down with it and find um, all kinds of refinements that you really only find when you're starting to actually use things. Like recently G30 was not behaving in a way that was very predictable or quite right. So I ended up modify spending a lot of time, like a couple of days, just playing with G30 and making that, you know, which is your single probe uh, yeah. command, uh, which was like, oh, yeah, if you do a single probe, it'll move there and then it'll stay there. And then you do it again and it'll keep moving as you do it because the probe has an offset. And it was like, oh, well, we want to fix that and have it move back after you're done. So I wanted to make that more consistent. And it may not behave in necessarily in ways that people are used to, but it is more consistent and I think better. It's... So yeah, things like that. Um, I would love to be able to do more testing. I used to have uh, a friend of mine sharing my apartment and he would do uh, more more of the testing and actually printing things and, and building plotters and, and working with lasers and stuff. So we got a lot of uh, interesting things done, but then he went on and uh, started doing a food truck instead. So uh, and starting his own business. So he still uses 3D printing for that. Uh, so that's, <laughs> so we still interact a bit um, as he's in uh, another, he's in Fort Worth and I'm here in Austin. So uh, we still share ideas and tips and might get him to do some design for me and stuff. But in general, it's just, uh, most of it is now just me and a few collaborators who are regulars uh, who you can find on Discord and, and you'll see their names uh, pop up a lot on GitHub as well. So yeah, it's uh, overall the project is very much uh, an effort of love, I guess you'd have to say, because everyone who sticks around and puts up with me has to be doing it for out of love, because otherwise they would, you know, easily just take off and do something much easier and less frustrating. I'm sure. What is the worst thing working with you? The worst thing about working with me is just yeah. that from day to day, I'm like rebooting and I never seem to have a plan. <laughs> it's like, I'm just going with the flow. It's like, uh, I really wanted to have input shaping, but I didn't know where quite to begin. And then suddenly it showed up uh, out of the blue, someone who had contributed uh, some other features, um, the model predictive temperature control, MPC temp. Uh, came along and had a, an idea for how to do ZV input shaping in a really smart way. It uses a lot of RAM, but it's like right in the 
right inside of the stepper code. And I was like, wow, can this really work? And uh, sure enough, you know, it worked, which was amazing. In that case, you're just making one, you're just making one separate, uh, you're just canceling out vibrations at one level with ZV input shaping. So it was kind of like, all you had to do was take for every step that it's generating, just divide it in half and then just time your other steps where the vibration happens or, you know, halfway in the period of the vibration and magically it worked. And I was just right. like blown away. And it helped me to understand input shaping at a deeper level. And then along came Ulendo.io, who is kind of like somewhat famous or infamous for putting out um, videos and, and research about their um, filtered B spline stuff a few years ago. And they were showing like pictures of, they were doing prints of the Capitol building on really crappy enders that uh, were yeah. intentionally messed up and then, uh, and then putting their filtered B spline on them and it would like, totally fix the problems of layer shifting and also give you a smoother print. So we didn't get the filtered B spline. Unfortunately, that's really their bread and butter. So they didn't want to donate that per se, but they gave us a new motion system and um, like a whole pile of new input shapers that go with that. And so we're just in the process of, I had to rewrite a bunch of that to get it to work with like nine axes and all the extruder weirdness that we have. But, um, but now it's in shape to for more testing and we've been getting that tested. And so, yeah, it's like, um, although a lot of my stuff is like code related and I'm trying to do things like, I don't necessarily rewrite everything from scratch myself and then do the whole design and build. I get a lot of contributions from others that um, I wouldn't be able to do a lot of this stuff without them. So there's that aspect to it. It's like those who contribute code are some of the best uh, contributions we get <laughs> for sure. So it, it does. And that's that's pro go, go ahead, Stefan. That's probably one of the beauties of like being open source. If you would be closed source, you would not have these contributions. And I guess this is one of the reasons why the ones who can should contribute to an open source development uh, because it helps getting to the technology forward faster um, in comparison of being closed source because then you would need to basically come up with everything else or hire a bunch of developers or you, you don't, I don't need know. to reinvent the wheel from scratch every single time that's that's the whole point right yeah um and it, yeah and the you know ulendo was started out with a you know as an academic research group and they were just using marlin because it was you know they could just download it and start experimenting mm -hmm. and then it turned into something that they they built and could contribute so yeah it's it's great that we could make that happen yeah i still remember them i i th i think the didn't they want to like sell printing time or they also had a business model behind their ulendo magic vibration compensation thingy and i always thought this was like one of the first implementations of, of input shaping, but they're doing something different, I guess. Yeah, it's more about the shape of the curve of the acceleration curve, okay. I guess, rather than um, the timing of the steps. So mm -hmm. yeah, input shaping is much more about those pulses. Because every mm -hmm. pulse generates an anti, you know, your makes your machine fly in the opposite direction mm -hmm. because of in, uh, inertia and momentum and all that, uh, all that magic. So yeah, it's uh, the, their research was uh, more around uh, the shape of the curve um, and input shaping. Uh, I think originally input shaping came from things like wanting to have large cranes move loads without having them swing around. <laughs> so, uh, so we're benefiting from you know the work of the construction industry uh, <laughs> here. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> so it it does sound like the the entire open source spirit. You know, everyone sort of contributes. Um, does work out for Marlin and and financially too. Like you, you've got companies who sell a product who who then donate a portion of that revenue to the developers. Um, but that is all based on 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 goodwill. Basically, nobody is required to pay for the stuff they use, right? And absolutely not. Like there's, we haven't got any kind of paywall. We have no, uh, you know, model where we have different tiers of support or anything like that. Um, we haven't made a foundation or, or done anything of the, on that level. Uh, it's all based around, you know, just, uh, 
the interchange between us, the companies that use Marlin, and the users who use Marlin, and that's it. Yeah, and uh, but okay, devil's advocate again. Um, but that is that is one of those situations where it can it can tip over, it can tilt too far one way. Um, what was it like one or two years ago? Was it curl? It was like one one of those like open source base level tools that every single server, every single application uses. And the developers like, yeah. hey, yeah, I've been maintaining this thing for the last 15 years. And, you know, I've got to do it in, in my in my spare time because, you know, even though I'm on billions of devices, nobody's supporting me for my work. So, yeah, and that's hard uh, when something is so invisible that, you know, and so accepted as just being a part of the system. Like, I don't know how many people as GNU programmers ever, you know, made money because they were selling or getting support for their GNU thing. Um, I think it's a little different for something like Marlin, where there is such a visibility around it. Um, every, you know, printers that use it, um, you know, any any board that has a single or any printer that has a single board in it that can, you know, handle uh, printing without add, adding on other hardware uh it's like using Marlin for the most part, and like that's that's our whole thing. It's like it's it's very visible because it's also at the it's it's sort of fueling a whole industry as well. Whereas something like Curl is just a small part of a bunch of tools that together form uh, something bigger. But we started right in the beginning, where you said if everyone who is running a printer with Marlin just pay you basically one dollar for each of their machines you would be well off so marlin itself is visible but your work behind the marlin pro uh, project is not as visible which is a real pity because without you and without your work marlin would just stagnate and yeah, I, mean, I, i try to live stream once in a while but it's very boring <laughs> to watch me code honestly <laughs> I don't know. Are there are there examples of of other projects where, like the developers or or a support is is more visible? I don't know. Uh, like where there's a Be where it's a smaller team and thing. I mean, I, I I'm trying to think of one. I mean, Apache was kind of a thing for a while. Uh, I. Linux, of course, itself, uh, Linus was, you know, the man behind mm -hmm. all that. And mm -hmm. so you know, he was everywhere, uh, but he's kind of uh, stepped back a little bit in recent times. Uh, yeah, I can't I can't think of too many projects that have that uh, that kind of visibility. I would hope that Clipper is is gaining in some visibility in that sense, uh, because, you know, they have uh, someone behind them. And of course, Octoprint has Gina um, as, you know, Our, our lord and master uh, of, you know, the she has a great uh, ethos and approach to coding and development. And so it's like, I'm always looking to her as a, as a, a guide and mentor for that sort of thing. But uh, I, ha I haven't, for example, talked to, to Gina for quite a while, but Tom, please correct me right here. I do have a bit of a feeling that Gina has kind of, the same problem as Marlin kind of has. It's it's there, it's mostly working for the people. So not really many have the incentive of supporting that because they think they already have what they are needing. Um, Clipper, I think at the moment is the big hype thing. And that's the reason why everyone I don't know how, how how their support looks like, but um, if currently you, you want to sell a printer and say that it runs Clipper, it's probably more people are going to buy it than if you're going to say it's it's running Marlin or it has Octoprint on it. And it is a pity that support is a bit hype-fueled. And I think that leads to the problem that at some point stable tools and stable projects like for example Marlin and Octoprint are I wouldn't say die but the the support is is going down and down over the time uh, because 
the advancement and the benefits with stability and stuff like that aren't that visible is is am, am i wrong right here or do you guys think that this this is a problem or, or could be a problem or could become a problem problem in the future yeah i mean we have to adjust with the times i think that uh, octoprint has had some luck in partnering and being getting promotions through um being included with some other product or You know, there could be something like a sonic pad that would be made with uh, with Octoprint on it that pairs with a printer that runs Marlin, for example, things like that. Although, you know, we're also looking at making Marlin interoperate well with Fluid and Mainsail so that people can enjoy those interfaces, but not necessarily have to have a Raspberry Pi uh, dedicated to running the printer as well. Um, they can just have it as a UI. Um, but yeah, like, uh, I mean, there was that early on, Octoprint was the only and first big, uh, nice Wi-Fi based, web-based host for 3D printing. And still, I think remains one of the best ones out there, uh, if not the best for various reasons. It has such a great plug-in architecture, for yeah. example, that allows for so much to be done. It has a very clean interface and it's well built so that it can Uh, it can accommodate a lot of things without getting messy and, and uh, you know, too hard to find things. Um, and in, gen in general, it's like it's got that really nice notification system in it and other things. So you always know what the latest news is or what the new, latest plugins are and things. So it has a, a really great infrastructure. But yeah, early on, it got that big boost because it was the first and only option and as people were getting into 3D printing, it was like, yeah, everyone was sharing it and around. And then after that initial hype dies down, then, then you have to look at how do you keep the momentum up or how do you maintain support for it? And it comes down to those, those users who really like it. Um, you know, Gina is sort of the, as the owner of the project, she has more control. And so she could actually dual license it and do different things to get a Like if she ever had to use a subscription model or whatever, uh, she could go for that. Uh, I'm in a different boat because Marlin is like, it wasn't built initially by me, but it's, and it's generally with all, every contributor to it has kind of a stake in the copyright over, you know, the, the overall copyright. And there is no single copyright holder, so to speak, that can change the license. If I ever want to change the license, I kind of have to do a big you, petition. And, you have to consult uh, every single go a, copyright owner, basically. Every little yeah. piece of the code needs to be approved. Um, yeah, so where, where, where somebody that's like, tricky. Like, like Prusa could come in um, because their Prusa slicer or their own firmware is, I don't know the number exactly, but 90% at least their own code now. And yes, it is published as as GPL, but they could still, uh, they could pull that. They could say, okay, from now on, our code, yes, what's been out there is GPL, but because we own the copyright, they can publish as something else, closed source, whatever. Um, yeah. They could do, and, but that's, and, uh, that's never been an option for you. Yeah, and copyright has become a little more strict in the sense that, you know, if you want to make a claim, you have to have a registration, and that gets tricky with this particular project. I, it's considered copyrighted, and it is built around an open source license that's protected by copyright. Uh, but when it comes down to, like, how to enforce that, the main option that we have available to us is to use, uh, basically, uh, we use the DMCA. So if someone is distributing a printer and they refuse to provide source code to their users, uh, I call up Amazon and I say, hey, you guys are selling a printer that's in violation of our license. And they say, well, we don't want to be liable for that, so we'll pull it off of our store. Yeah, because basically so it is it is pirated code, right? It is it is code that you're using without owning a license to it. It's like you download yeah. a crack for Autodesk or whatever. Yeah, the license is the only thing that gives you the right to distribute Marlin at all in binary form. Uh, and if you don't honor the license, then you don't have the right. And so that's kind of yeah. how it all boils down. And so that's that's what, kind of what we're left with is I have to somewhat police it. And I've tried that in the past and it, it I don't know how, I didn't get a lot of feedback from like the vendor about how they felt about having their printer pulled off Amazon, but it did have an effect and they did eventually, you know, they did speed up their, their compliance. So uh that that can work um but it's it's sort of like if you start getting lawyers involved it gets very expensive very quickly yeah uh and 
we can't do things like turn to the Free Software Foundation because they only can get involved if they actually have the copyright transferred to the Free Software Foundation. Right. So that's sort of like, you know, because then they have a, <laughs> then they actually have standing. Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, I would have to be, as a copyright holder, I have standing. So, you know, I would have to be the person to take legal action if that were ever needed. Fortunately, it really hasn't ever had to come down to that. We've been very lucky to have, uh, you know, productive conversations with almost all the vendors. Um, and that's been good. We sometimes get a little surprised when someone comes along and says, hey, we're, we're, we're sharing the source code now. And, we, and I was never aware that they weren't. Uh, <laughs> Snapmaker. But, yeah, I think that was one, Snapmaker. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm like, well, good to hear it. Um, but you, know, you should have been doing that all along. But uh, it's like, you know, I, I just can't be chasing these down all day. I've got yeah. enough to do just doing the code exactly. stuff. So. And then, and then also the, the, the thinking is like, what is, what is the damage done to you if, if a company is just using your code and not sharing, you know, distributing it in binary form and not sharing the source too, source too, is there, is there actual damage done to you? And is it any different from different? You can, you can do this as well. If you go into your Tesla app and you go to your profile and you have dunk sagungen, you have like this, <laughs> this, this whole list of we're using all these open source projects, and it has the project name and the the developer behind it, and I can keep, I can just keep scrolling here. There's, there's probably, yeah. there's probably a hundred thousand projects in here. Um, <laughs> yeah, and how many of those did they modify? Um, uh, you know, it's hard to say. And do they keep a sort? Do they, does uh, Tesla have a GitHub uh, where yeah, I can go and download their latest uh, self driving uh, software? No, of that course be, not. That would be nifty. Um, but well, there's, there's like, I think if they open sourced it, it might make it safer. You know, I mean, it's it's got yeah. a public interest. Yeah, um, <laughs> get on that, I, Australia. <laughs> yeah, you did uh, that but, with your voting systems. Why not? Why not Tesla? Right, but there's, uh, but there's, there's no. Is there any value in, or is there any functional difference in in them using the code and not publishing it, and using it and not contributing anything? Like the yeah. I, the yeah, end I mean, result really, really is only visibility, right? Yeah, I mean, well, it really comes down to the cu the customer's rights. Um, you know, as users of Marlin, they're entitled to the source code. And if the vendor doesn't, you know, if they if the customer asks and they say no, you know, get out of here, uh, which often happens, like they're not helping their customer service because customers are entitled to that source code and they know that there a lot of them know that and uh, there have been instances where people got mad at companies because they were continuously trying to get uh, access to the source code and, and not being given it uh, simply because they wanted to upgrade or you know get some new feature that we had or fix something that was not working correctly in the particular version they put out and vendors often do get it a little wrong when they put out firmware. They'll, you know, just in the case of the Ender 5 S1, overall pretty good, but the acceleration was way too high. Uh, you know, the interface could definitely do with some fixes, and there were other issues in there. And wouldn't it be nice to turn on input shaping and have it print a little smoother? Uh, you know, they don't, they can't do that if they don't have some version of Marlin that has the code to talk to the display and. Uh, and knows what pins are doing what and stuff like that. So, you know, just just on the on the simplest basis, all we need is a configuration file and a pins file, and that's it. Yeah. Um, but if they've added new hardware, then we also need to know how to talk to that hardware, what the protocol is, and what to expect as far as you know, are they sending messages? And we were trying to make APIs for that, but you know, every vendor find some new way to add new things into the code or make modifications because they don't necessarily like the way that it does homing yeah. uh, or they want to home before some other procedure all the time and that's but not for, necessary for, for that yeah. sort of for that sort of uh, customer benefit um, well you do need the source code you need, you do need to know how to talk to the machine but you also need to you also need a way to actually then use it on the machine and that's been a problem with um, the some of the the end of threes where all of a sudden the machine doesn't have a bootloader anymore and the procedures of plugging it in and using the Arduino programmer doesn't work anymore um, right or, you know you need you need you need a programmer that works with that MCU in there um, yeah so yeah. even though that they're in compliance the user experiments uh, experiments ex experience is basically well you you can't modify it easily anymore 
Yeah, and I haven't seen too many of those bootloaders that do things like look for a CRC or some special thing. I think with the uh, going back to the Ender 5 S1 or a couple other qualities, I think they have a thing where you have to set byte 90, to, uh, offset 90 in the EEPROM to a certain value if you want to flash the firmware. And if it isn't there, then it won't flash. And that's really obscure, which means, you know, it means you have to have firmware on there already or some program that modifies the EEPROM already to be able to put the next one on. And then if you put the next one on, it has to also make sure to have that in it and turned on. Otherwise, you won't be able to flash it again. Although I think that's, uh, I, I know the code is in there, but I don't know, I don't know if it always, if it means that it actually requires it because I've been able to flash it without having to go through that. So hmm. yeah, I just followed some video tutorial on YouTube and yeah, <laughs> had no problem doing the upgrade. So I guess it's not always required. Um, but yeah, it seemed like it was something they were leaning towards, but I would like to see less of that and just, you know, cause it's, you know, there's no, it's not like users are going to accidentally flash firmware on there by mistake and mess it up unless they, you know, they generally know a little bit what, about what they're doing when they get into that process. So, uh, and I was always wondering, Tom, I was sorry. I was always wondering. So if creality or some other manufacturer if they are modifying their firmware is this something that they usually do by themselves or are they even is there a possibility that companies approach you and ask you hey you we will give you x amount of money to implement that feature i think you already said you have kind of a reward program something like that i don't know if that's also um if that's also something where, where where this could become a thing, but are they doing that? You are they usually doing that by themselves, or do they also have the possibility to approach you and and tell you, yeah, we're gonna contribute that amount of money uh, if you are doing that for us? Yeah, I've actually uh, most well, let's see, the only company I've done that with has been Creality um, so far. Uh, where they actually uh, approached me about the uh, Ender 3 V2 uh, and the interface on that. And I, I got that um, initially, it didn't do subfolders. So I had to code up the code to make it do subfolders. But I mean, I would have rather that the whole thing was made to use Marlin UI, which is the native menu system, which was originally, it's been in Marlin forever. And the idea is, you know, you implement a few functions and make it, you know, work w the right for your display and then everything else is handled for you. So it'll, you'll get any time that new menu items are added, they just show up on your, on your display. Mm -hmm. But uh, now we have Pro UI and Gyres UI and all these variants. And then I also did end up implementing Marlin UI for that display. But initially, yeah, they approached me about that and I got a little stipend for that. And then uh, Naomi came along when the CR30 belt printer came out and needed some help with, uh, with that and testing. And most of that was actually pretty much complete by that point. And the only thing I mainly did was uh, a little cleanup, and then uh, I wrote uh, a new G code M808, so you could do looping and reprint, like not have to have a giant file if you wanted to print yeah. 100 things. You would just have it <laughs> print once, and then it could tell it to go back to this point in the file and start over. And so mm. you just created loop points, basically. Uh, and I named it M808 after the uh, 808. Uh, loop Drum generator yeah. the Roland 808 I think it's called yeah uh, yeah a little so you know a little reference there but um, yeah the idea behind and uh, I got a small stipend for that as well but they generally uh, they haven't lately approached me and I would like I wish they would a little more just because there have been things like that could be better <laughs> and I know that if if we had a crack at it um, you know and maybe they're just in a hurry and they, I know the, their their release cycle for new machines is just crazy, and uh, and I think that they do actually have a dedicated firmware team at Creality, a uh, small group, and I'm actually in touch with them on Discord, but we hardly ever interact. Uh, there is a language barrier somewhat, um, and you know, um, and I have to be careful not to you know get into cultural discussions <laughs> and things like that. So it's like, it kind of becomes a little tricky, but um, overall, I think it's like, you know, the possibility to collaborate and, and, and interchange is definitely there, but they should just, just come to, you know, the usual way with pull requests and things uh, on mm -hmm. GitHub. Uh, Big Tree Tech is very good about doing it that way. 
and they have a couple of, uh, of folks who are there uh, who enter, who work with them and are kind of liaisons um, and uh, have been, you know, uh, very helpful in sort of transcending the language barrier. And of course, we all can uh, understand the code. So it's like if okay. they contribute code, I can say, oh, well, we just change this and change that. And I don't necessarily have to speak a lot of English. I can just speak C++ and... Uh, <laughs> and we have, and, that, and in that yeah. way, we also we have an exhibit A to kind of work around, and you know, even if it's just a concept, we can start to work on it and build around it. And then once it's done, um, it's they have it, and then we have it available for the next version. So, you know, I don't know that I don't know that cloning. And we can maybe get into this about hardware as well. Is whether whether cloning is is as big a problem as it might be made out to be. Um, I know that with Creality, I had met with them at um, Earth when they were at Earth a few years ago. Um, I actually met up with Jack Chen and some other folks from Creality. And we discussed uh, the, the question of, you know, how, how to comply with open source. You know, can we wait six months before we put out the source code? And I was like, well, no. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, you know, as soon as someone asks, you kind of have, you can't say no. You know, well, as, as soon you, as a as soon as a customer asks who has bought the machine, you don't yeah. l l like you've mentioned, you don't need to put it on GitHub for everyone. You just need to provide it with the binaries that you sold yeah. someone gave someone. Exactly, and you know they could stick it on the SD card if they wanted to. It's not uh, it's not a huge source source code base. Uh, of course, you know if they do, that means that they're going to have everything on there that maybe they don't want to put everything on there. Uh, they don't necessarily have to have all the LCD files for every LCD and all that. So. You know, if they wanted to strip out some files or whatever, but it's always easier to just make a zip of it and just stick it on there. Um, and they could certainly do that if they wanted to. Um, but uh, and that would take care of the problem of having to to wait for a customer to ask and and maybe people would you know ignore it until they were interested and then they would look and go oh. You know, they might even have to be told, "Hey, it's on the SD card." Oh, I didn't even think to look. Uh, <laughs> but in general, like there are ways it. to get around that. And I and at the time they were also. Um, a little bit um, spicy about the OSHWA, like putting out open source hardware certified stuff as the Ender 3 was actually open source hardware association certified and compliant, which uh, at the time I was like, well, I don't know if open source hardware is, you know, something I necessarily think you have to do as a, in order to rep, you know, represent that you're uh, a supporter of open source. And I think they were a little worried that, well, probably very worried that uh, all the cloners would come along and undercut their sales and that, you know, they would then be in this kind of a similar position to anyone who worries about that. Um, and I know that uh, Prusa is also concerned that if they open source their hardware, suddenly there'd be lots of clones. Although I haven't seen anything out there that looks like a, a, a Prusa i3 Mark III. No one makes clones of those, but I everyone makes, you know. I have a Physitech Mark III clone kit. I've got it right next oh, to right. me. The entire thing, like mainboard, mm. printed, well, printed, yeah. hard, printed parts, I don't think. But um, right. the, how many of those did they sell? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. But the, I mean, what yeah. what, what Prusa are doing is they're making proprietary parts. Um, like everything yeah. on the machine is like its own proprietary thing. So you can't just go out there and and sort of source it. You have to manufacture it to that exact same spec. Um, yeah, that's tricky. Which so is, yeah, it makes it harder for people to just clone it and put out you know a cheaper version of the Prusa i3 and then market it as such. Exactly. Yeah, and and uh, for example, the coded PI bits they they have a lot of expertise in that. That of course they're not just publishing. Right, um, and I, you know I, I mean Prusa is you know they they have a certain price point that they that they have to meet, and it does cost them a, you know a, an extra premium to build those machines the way that they build them. Uh, I mean, if they were to use injection molded parts, for example, they'd probably save a lot of energy and, you know, time and money, and they could make their, put out their printers cheaper. But I think they, maybe they're concerned that the, because uh, injection molded parts have a little seam on them that it would look unprofessional or something. I'm not sure, but, uh, or they've invested, you know, they've got that uh, sunk cost as it were, yeah. in, in in their uh, printer farm, and they want to make you know, and the printer farm is kind of a marketing uh, part, a part of their marketing as well. Uh, and you know, so there's some question as to whether they really want to sacrifice their print farm uh, 
uh, and you know, which to them is like, well, they want to show that you could have a print farm too and be profitable and see, it's not that hard. And, and also they develop technology True. around that print farm that uh, they wouldn't be able to necessarily develop if they didn't have that print farm. So, you know, there's some value in there in it to them, but I think it's like, it's definitely comes with a, a trade-off, you know, that does take them longer to make the parts that they need to make and they cost more to make them and they use more energy to make them than they uh, would I mean, with injection molding. So what they've what like, they've always maintained is like, hey, know, it allows us to iterate more quickly on these parts. Um, if we see something that's wrong, we can just change the STL, we can send it to our printers and we get the, the, the updated part next day. We don't have to remachine a mold and, and wait for the parts to show up. We can iterate true. much, much more quickly and sort of implied as a result, make a better machine. Uh, yeah, and I think they also want to prove that 3D printing has arrived as a manufacturing concept. Yeah. It's not something that has to just be on the consumer toy level. You can actually use it for your own business. And, uh, and you know, and they, I imagine they get some grants uh, from the Czech Republic that helps somewhat support their business um, and some tax breaks possibly um, because they're some of, somewhat of an exemplary business, and if they follow certain rules and and do certain promotions and other things that inter and interact with the government in certain ways, they can benefit from that, and they get somewhat lower costs as a result of that. So, though I'm, uh, I'm sure they're not the only ones uh, getting those, oh, yeah. those sort of government grants. Um, but that yeah, is a that not. is a that is a whole different topic. <laughs> That's a yeah, whole, look at whole SpaceX. different kind of worms. Yeah. Um, but sort of sort of tracking back onto onto free open source, Stefan, we're kind of leaving you out of the loop here. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> you look very relaxed. Yeah, um, bring the, bring those hard questions, Stefan. <laughs> what can we do for test rigs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the where was going with this? Um, yeah, so maybe to, to circle around to to like the supplying code because I as as far as I'm aware the the requirement is not to supply code to everyone um, and also not to supply it free of charge. There used to be this thing where you send in a you know a letter with postage and then you get the CD back or something. Um, mm. What Red Hat did recently is they put their entire code behind a paywall, and I didn't fully follow this, but I was like, yes, they can probably do this but um it might not be the the smoothest thing to do what they've always done is they've they've sort of monetized open source differently um of course red hat linux is a is sort of an enterprise grade linux distribution um that i don't know if you actually pay for the for the for the software but you do pay for a support subscription basically they're, they're not selling the software they're selling the support for it um, which kind of right. cr creates a weird incentive to make the software worse to use, so you actually require the support. But that's a, that's different. Um, they've always been well, they've always been good at, uh, I guess, because they've survived. I, I would imply that they're good at at making right decisions there. So my thinking is, it must be a decision that that sort of makes sense to sort of force a recurring revenue onto your software. What's the What's what's your take on that entire thing? Well, my first question would be, I mean, who are the users of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and what are they using it for? I mean, it's I don't imagine there's like some office building where every user is sitting behind a screen running Linux instead of Windows or Mac OS or whatever it is that they use to run their business. I imagine it probably has some niche uh, and that's and then their customers are I would imagine it probably centers around uh, services and you know data centers and things like that. Uh, so, you know, they can't exactly bundle services like iCloud or you know uh, Microsoft uh, you know login or whatever, uh, and then have every desktop user um, buy a, a subscription to that. So they don't have that revenue stream. So they have to come up with other ways to build their revenue stream around that. And I, I imagine the, initially they were, you know, they were basically curating a, a build of Linux that had certain components in it. It was certain versions that were certified and tested and that, you know, what you were getting value out of it because you didn't have to do that work to certify and test. And you could kind of trust that they had already done that work. And then you had customer support or user support or 
you know, general support. Uh, and then they would sell, uh, you know, that on a monthly subscription or something along those lines or probably yearly. Uh, and then they would sell seats and other things for that. And so they could kind of get large enterprises to pay more and other things, you know, and, and what does it require to run Red Hat Enterprise Linux and maintain it and keep it going? You know, what kind of infrastructure have they built up to do that? You know, are they renting uh, a big building somewhere to do that? And how much extra cost and overhead are they incurring as a result of their commitment to this thing? Uh, there's so many questions around it and how the, how could they, you know, improve their revenue stream, putting it behind a paywall? I mean, what's to keep someone for who to take the open source, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux that they got from the paywall and just put it up on GitHub? Uh, if the license is GPL or whatever, then there is nothing preventing that. You can freely well, share the code. It's the same thing. Want. Like, what is what is preventing someone from taking the Marlin code and putting it up on their own GitHub? And and like, I guess the idea is you you make the Marlin project obsolete by hey, we've got this other thing that isn't Marlin. Yeah, and is still Marlin, but it's not Marlin. Yeah, that's that's the question. It would it's sort of a question of you know where to where do, are people expected to go to get the official version or whatever, um, and. You know, there is also uh, what was the the fork of um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux that is kind of like involved in this. I forget. There's a, another. There's a smaller sort of like I mean, more they've, user centric. They've got Fedora, which is basically is right. Red Hat's take, but it's it's officially from Red Hat, but you don't get any support for it. Yeah. Now there's another one that that's sort of like I, I know that uh, Jeff Gearling has been talking about it recently, but I can't remember the name. We'll have to look that one up, but. Uh, but yeah, there, there's sort of like some controversy Alma about that Linux? because, uh, it wasn't Alma. Um, it's something else. I'm going to, I'm going to say it begins with a C. Where, um, okay. um, but yeah, there was, uh, some other version, but it's sort of like more on the, on the level of like an Ubuntu or something like that, right. um, where it's meant to run on smaller platforms okay. and, uh, be more kind of, you know, desktop friendly and stuff. So. Uh, but yeah, that, that gets caught up in this sort of problem is like, well, now we want to put all these things behind paywalls. Uh, I mean, the, it's really a question of, you know, if you are going to get into the business of doing something to make money with open source, um, you know, you're making a bed and you're going to have to sleep in it. Uh, and how are they going to, you know, maintain that? Is it sustainable? And can they sustain it? in the same way or do they have to change with the times and you know what is allowable with by the licenses that are surrounding these things um and you know in general the license guarantees source code availability and that's the main thing the whole point the whole point of it being open source is that the source is open um you can of course you know if it costs you something to keep a server and store stuff and make and send out uh, CDs to people, then you can charge for that cost and, you know, ask people to pay, you know, $2 for the mailing of a CD or something like that. Now, these days with the internet, uh, it's like, you know, the cost is spread out so much, you know, like every user could contribute a nickel and they would be fine for the next hundred years, I would imagine, as far as server costs go. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, could, what is it that, uh, that makes it uh, that is their problem. I'd like to see more of a of a deep analysis on what are their complaints and what have they tried and why did they settle on this as a as a solution and you know and then in, in the long run how's it going to go? You know, the, the, is the is it worth all the blowback from people to try this out and then have it be uh, such a hassle? It's like it's like with uh, software piracy, you're trying to protect. Your software from piracy, but if you make it harder for everyone, oh god, yeah. uh, you know, then it's like, is it really worth it uh, to to just deal with it? Sales you might have never gotten in the first place, you know, because people are going to generally get things the most convenient way. They're going to download it off Steam rather than go to some torrent server and go through yeah. the hassle of having to it's the, find it's some license model, generator. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, do is are you losing or are you just not? gaining uh it, there's it's you know would you really have gotten those sales in the first place you know yeah. can 
is piracy really the problem that it's made out to be? And there's always, of course, from their side, they'll always exaggerate it and say, you know, try to get the biggest uh, settlement that they can from a court or whatever yeah. by claiming that it's, you know, a million and they'll settle for 10,000 because they were really only after that 10,000 in the first place. Um, so, yeah, it's like, and there's an, and these days it seems that there's a culture of like, you know, let's just exaggerate and 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 we'll just use that. You know, we can maybe if we flatter the right people, we'll get politicians to back us and and this kind of thing. And it's sort of like, you know, it's a lot. A lot of it becomes noise and and loses its meaning. So it's like it's hard to know what the real practical problem is and whether they're really trying to do things in an ethical way or if they're just trying to, you know, uh, profit because some new they have a new holding company and that new holding company wants to get the most that they can before the thing falls apart, which they know it's going to anyway, or who knows, you know, uh, there's so many different levels to it. Yeah. And it's like, even with, uh, like when Prusa put out his uh, state of the open source thing, I didn't see a lot of details there about what it is that, that what are the problems they're facing? What are their, what is it on their balance sheet that's showing, uh, that they're losing or gaining and how do they track where that's coming from and what, who are they losing to and in what way, uh, are there, you know, is there use of open source in one form or another, whether it's hardware or software or whatever, uh, leading to a problem, you know, is it really a big issue if Orca Slicer is based on Prusa Slicer and Bamboo uses it? Um, is it up to, should Bamboo be using Cura instead and making profiles for that? Um, you know, what would be the difference there as far as Prusa's bottom line? Um, can they, because they built it around Slick3R, um, use that, uh, build some kind of licensing model that might be hard or, pro or prohibited by the license of Slick3R? Yeah, exactly. You, you um, would need to, to do everything from scratch again. Um, yeah. But for, for, for you personally, you, you've you also tweeted that finances are tight. I, I, I feel like that's been resolved. Um, but uh, it's... It's uh, it's been better lately. Um, right. One of our backers was Big Tree Tech, and they got kicked off when GitHub right. changed uh, their something in their model, and uh, MK MakerBase also got kicked off. Um, Big Tree Tech immediately um, wanted to remedy it, come back, but there was some mix up, and so that took them a little while. But they're back. Yeah. Uh, as of yesterday, they're back. Uh, so that's nice. Good thank uh, thank yeah. goodness for that, because that was that was a real a uh, big part of what was keeping me f afloat. Yeah. Um, but it's it's and, always uh, that it's always that that balance of you have to you have to justify spending time on the project. You have to justify you know again, spending your time and then giving it away for free. There needs to be that that revenue. And I'm I'm sort of afraid that at some point once you once you amass enough resources, enough developers, enough energy spent on something that it's just not totally viable anymore to to give it away for free and that you have to sort of grow past uh open source at some point um see right yeah, and and for me i mean it's really i mean th we're talking about the amount of money it takes to sustain one individual in an apartment uh and you know, just barely. It's not like I'm, you know, when I've got when I've worked at real real programming jobs, you know, my salary has been quite uh, substantial and more than enough to have an apartment and then a car and you know things like that. People generally in the mainstream expect that they're going to have a car and a house and all that kind of thing. I'm happy to have an apartment where I can just keep my printers on tables. And uh, and, a, and a bedroom and a spare, you know, a spare room where all the printers are. And uh, that's enough for me. But, you know, imagine if we did have to have an enterprise where you have salaried people with PhDs who expect a certain um, level of income and, you know, a certain lifestyle and a vacation of six weeks a year and all these other things. Um, it's like uh, that that's that would be really, really much larger, you know, for, uh, in terms of, uh, I'd be out begging a lot more if that was what I had to sustain. <laughs> but uh, what is keeping you actually from like working a normal job again? Do you feel an obligation of maintaining Marlin? Is it the thing you always wanted to do? Is it 
Is yeah, it I just mean, that you love open source? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's initially my, my aim was to do uh, shareware when that was more of a thing. Uh, <laughs> and I had a few shareware products, but uh, they didn't make enough to you know pay rent. Uh, but it was nice to have a little extra income during the year. And it was a fun way to like, you know, do some programming and get a little reward for it um, and do kind of programs that I wanted to do anyway, like for guitar, uh, a sequencer around guitar and music theory and uh, a, a driver for Wacom's uh, serial tablets that Wacom abandoned were like my big open source projects. And one well, move shareware and the other one was, uh, was my first open source project was that Wacom driver. And then, uh, you know, and so... Uh, I wasn't really aiming to go full time doing open source per se, but I really liked having open source and and uh, doing the kind of project that you would want to open source, like a driver for Wacom tablets that you know you couldn't necessarily sell. But and then if I really wanted to get help with that, like I didn't know everything about every tablet and I didn't have every tablet and I don't know how you would get the word out that you wanted to get every tablet and I couldn't afford to go and buy them. So open sourcing is kind of a good way to get the word out and get contributors to come along and throw a little hardware into the mix, throw some code into the mix, throw some knowledge into the mix. Wacom themselves in Europe, well, at least Wacom Europe was very helpful as far as providing information uh, and things like that at that time. And so that was kind of like something I really, I enjoyed that process and really just having that suddenly people coming out of the woodwork who wanted to help. That was really fun. And I liked being like in the middle of that mix. And it wasn't, uh, when I came to um, Marlin, I was really just, I was looking to start doing uh, like creative coding and get into Arduino. And because that was sort of the central platform for things like building art installations using code and that involved code and involved electronics. And it was like, well, what should I do to sort of start to cut my teeth on this stuff? And it was like, well, a 3D printer would be the, a good first project. I'll build one of those. I'll learn how to program Arduino and I'll learn some electronics and I'll actually have something at the end of it that I can use as a tool to do other neat stuff. And uh, so that first project became like the project I got stuck on. Because I got Marlin, which was sort of in its infancy, it was really made to run on Ultimakers, and uh, and I was like, well, I don't like this click sound, so I'm going to make that better. It's too chirpy, <laughs> and uh, and so we go. <laughs> little by little, you know, it was just oh, I should fix this, and I could help with that, and because I had C plus plus knowledge from working with uh, you know games in the past and some other projects, the Wacom tablet involved some C plus uh, plus. Uh, I was like, well, I've got some experience here. I can I can figure it out. And uh, yeah, little by little, it just became like, you know, uh, the the other guys who were involved in sort of running it wanted to step aside and focus on their stuff uh, at Ultimaker and elsewhere. And so it was like, yeah, we need someone to sort of like step in and sort of maintain this stuff. And so I kind of just fell into that role. And, uh, and then it became that it was just taking up so much of my time that... I didn't really have uh, uh, time to go and and go into that other stuff, and really there wasn't a lot of opportunity for that sort of thing. As a like, I went to a company in Portland who will remain nameless, um, and uh, and they were they seemed keen to hire me to do this sort of thing. But I went in one morning with a little too much Benadryl in my system and was a little loopy. And I think they th thought I was like high or something and, or too weird for, or not fitting to their culture. So I never quite got that job. Um, so, uh, so much, for, so, so much for that kind of like ambition. I was like, well, I'll just throw myself into this Marlin thing and we'll see where it goes. And then, uh, a, a little enterprise called Maker Arm came along and were willing to pay me for my time and to help them develop their project. So, that's how I ended up in Austin, Texas, initially. And uh, with a bit of income from that, I was able to sort of tie, get myself through to a period where suddenly the Patreon started to build up. And then it was, by the time that uh, that project ended, I was ready, I was actually in a position to be able to at least share rent with another person. And so uh, that started to sort of build from there. And so I was able to really just focus full time on it and live modestly 
and, you know, give up my car and bike around instead, which, you know, you want to do anyway, as you get older, keep up the activity level. Otherwise, you know, uh, you might, uh, you know, just turn into a couch or something, uh, especially doing code. So I was like, yeah, this is a good balance for me. I can, I can be creative. I can do other things. I'll have the free time to, you know, work on music or, or, or other projects. And at the same time, like I can code and, and I'll just, you know, have that open lifestyle and it sort of has worked out pretty well uh, in that regard but you know it's definitely living modestly i'm not going to be able to you know uh, buy a 401k and retire or anything like that and at some point i probably will have to go back and get some kind of real job and i guess uh these days you go if you've been doing coding for a while you do ma project management or something like that so Consulting. who knows but I'll, I'll cross that bridge when i come to it um at this point like i'm pretty satisfied working on Marlin and gain, gaining and continuing to gain that experience, especially in just managing a project. Like that's something that has been like working with a big team and stuff has not been something I was too used to. So um, kind of building up on those skills has been really helpful. So it'll all come out to be useful education in the long run. Um, you know, I'm a lifelong student of the, in the school of hard knocks. And so this is a great place to be. Yeah for that to uh you know continuously have challenges in all kinds of areas um and you know we'll see how it we'll see how it continues to develop as long as i have uh the financial backing to be able to do marlin and and it is like it's advancing in all kinds of really interesting ways and with these new boards like that are so powerful we have so much you know possibility to add new intelligence to it and like just this new input shaping stuff that's coming in from ulendo is really gonna uh, it's it's gonna be making it possible for your average rep wrapper to make something that rivals a bamboo machine. So as long as it's constrained well and can handle the amount of flow and other things, like I don't see any reason why we couldn't be running at those kinds of speeds. Um, and you know, people talk about how Clipper is great because it can offer higher accelerations. Well, actually, acceleration is not something that is in any way limited. You can do high acceleration on an AVR 8-bit machine because it just means, you know, when you want to go to your highest speed, you just do that more quickly. You just do yeah. that in fewer steps. It actually is like, in a way, cheaper to do higher acceleration than to do lower acceleration. Um, but you want to what you want to sustain is like those high rates of... Um, checking when the next step should be so that you can get that next step right on time. And that's where the 32 bit faster stuff comes in handy. So it's like, you know, I'm learning so much about just like dealing with motion systems and physics as well, uh, in that casual way and with hands-on experience and stuff I would have never ever imagined learning about if I hadn't jumped into this field. So it's like, it's a big, um, crash course in in electrical engineering mechanical engineering um all these all these challenges come into play so it's i mean it's just uh that's kind of where I, where i'm at i like i just love mm -hmm. to continue learning and challenging myself and and it, and it just happens that uh code is my main forte so that's where i'm focused uh, but you know in the future maybe i'll do more of the mechanical side or the electronic side who knows oh so sorry um <laughs> now 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 uh you can go on okay um yeah so i i was i was actually going to close this out with with like one last question um since you were speaking of like the future and what's what's coming um mm. what what is your prediction for 3d printing what's what's going to be the the next big thing of course now input shaping's been the, the big thing what's going to be the the next big feature everyone's going to want to have and is it going to be open source and how is open source going to continue in this the next big thing well i mean everyone wants their prints to be faster and more reliable and for if there is a failure for it to catch it before you end up with a pile of spaghetti or a big blob of uh, stuff on your hot end prusa has done a lot of work in no observing the heating behavior and so it can actually detect if there's a blob of filament on your hot end it won't be losing as much heat as quickly and therefore you can say that's probably a problem and we haven't been tracking that yet, so that's something we want to get into Marlin. Uh, we want with the new input shaper and fixed time motion. That means we should be able to achieve higher speeds on hardware that can handle higher speeds. Uh, 
So I think the next big thing is for inexpensive printers in the under you know seven hundred dollar range, in the three hundred dollar range, in the two hundred dollar range to actually be able to achieve the kinds of speeds that your bamboo achieves. Of course, that may rely somewhat on Core XY uh, being the motion system with bed slingers and belts. You may have some limitations just because belts are stretchy and beds are heavy. And as your print gets heavier, you know, you have to deal with that. But the new stuff from Ulendo actually does have like adjusting the frequency as your Z changes to accommodate yeah. the fact that your print may, it may be wobbling more as it gets taller uh, on a bed slinger. Um, but yeah, I think that, and you look at like things like the Rook, which is a nice uh, rep wrap open source, little core XY printer, um, you know, put a bamboo hot end on that. And I don't, I can't see why you wouldn't be able to achieve bamboo like speeds. The next stuff is of course, AI like is kind of as a buzzword, we'll just say uh, smarter code that can observe the print and keep and sense when things are happening. Um, I don't know that using cameras for anything other than that first layer makes any sense. There's a lot of this idea of like spaghetti detection and things like that. And maybe there's some merit to that. Uh, I mean, if, but it's, if, it's, if you can prevent it from happening in the first place, that would be the preferable option. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, having a camera on there that you can check with your phone. Uh, so more, you know, I think it's, it's good if you have uh, printers with cameras on them makes sense um, so that you can at least check in and having a Wi-Fi on there so that you can connect it to your network for at least that purpose. Um, I don't like printers that go to cloud services or require a login or any, any of that. That seems yeah. like uh, that's uh, secondary marketing. And uh, people have complained, like, you know, that they get a lot of marketing messages from these things uh, on their apps, and they just really do not like that. It makes them angry at the vendor instead of uh, happy that they got this product. They're suddenly, they're just a target for marketing, and that annoys people. Uh, so I think that, you know, I think that the, at least in the hobbyist space, um, in the casual printing space, I think people will still favor printers that that are open pla open platform that they can reach the components, do more you know changing and standardization. I like the the new hot end uh, ecosystem that's out there. The um, the hot ends that uh, Prusa has on their new machine is a really is a really cool idea. You know the long throat that takes care of constraining everything all the way down is a great idea. Uh, hopefully you can avoid clogs and things, but there's always going to be some piece of grit in cheap filament or that ends up in there just because a piece of ABS fell into your PLA or something like that. Uh, so it's hard to avoid that sort of thing. But, you know, as long as you can catch it in some way, um, you have, uh, for example, your extruder motor now, you know, because it might be a trinamic motor, can tell if it's stalling. So you may be able to detect jams just from this extruder motor. So we want to add, you know, jam detection would be a good thing to have. So those kinds of things, more intelligence um, and taking advantage of the newer hardware. Um, there's also CAN bus. And I've been talking with uh, a lot of people about uh, supporting the fly maker, like CAN bus extensions and things, because people seem to like just running power and serial to their hot end and that's it. And everything else is taken care of by the board there. There's a little bit of question of whether that uh, those extra components are just another point of failure. Um, but, you know, I mean, the, the electronics being all on one board, it means that if anything fails on that one board, you have to replace or fix that one board and you can't do anything. Whereas maybe if it fails on the hot end, you could still, you know, do some things with your board, but of course you'll have to wait for your hot end to be fixed and all that. So it's a trade off one way or another. It's, you know, but CAN bus seems like a really interesting prospect for the future and people seem to want it for one reason or another. And so... Uh, at least if if only to support these, um, probably there'll be a lot of hot end extruder assemblies that are totally built around these CAN bus uh, components. So we might as well support that. And so those are the kinds of things that we're working on is just like keeping up with the technology as it advances and adding more intelligence and really taking advantage of like the fact that we have 32-bit boards that are running at like ridiculous higher speeds than we ever could possibly need. <laughs> and it's like, what to do with all that extra power and really take advantage of it? Because, you know, we don't want to just be sitting there idle if there's stuff, if there's extra stuff we could be checking 
and doing to make it work smoother and better. So that to me is like what where we're going is just they're going to be you'll be able to have printers that are on the inexpensive side that you'll still be able to add on to. And so I think what we'll probably see is the you know when you get that $150 printer that just has the bare bones stuff on it, you'll be able to more easily add more components to that and upgrade it. And so it'll become much more of a like Lego system. And I think that's probably the direction we're going. I hope we'll see E3D kind of get on that and um, and kind of partner with some of these printer makers that are looking at that. Um, and I think that Prusa also still has a place because they provide that all-in-one. It's already pre-made. It's reliable. It has the intelligence in it. And, you know, they you pay a bit of a premium for that, but you get a really great machine out of the box, something that lasts a while, and you don't have to be tinkering with it all the time. For people who want to tinker, you know, you have many ways to go. But for people who want something reliable, I think that Prusa kind of stands out as being one of the one of the main purveyors of that kind of product. And I think that there's definitely going to always be a, a room for that. And they may have uh, more openings in education and enterprise as a result of that as well. So, you know, that's the direction for them to look at, as, and I'm sure they are. So, yeah, for us, it's just, you know, keeping up with stuff and making our toy version of what the pros are putting out um, and trying to make our toy version not such a toy version and make it really be uh, on that same level if we can and make it as professional as we can and as reliable and and stuff so maybe our our processes could be modernized a lot as well to, to facilitate that so that's that's kind of what i'm looking at is just keeping up and really just becoming better at this stuff and knowing more and and being the master of all things <laughs> to make it happen good times to come it sounds like oh yeah <laughs> okay and with that i think we've we've reached our 90 minutes people should be satisfied with a full with a fully <laughs> packed episode jeff anything from from you that you still want to want to get off your chest i i think uh considering the time i'm good uh with that um yeah i i think i need to use marlin more and we to need to honest. use your test rigs more. <laughs> we need, to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we need like, someone like I, you I, to I build kind of us became, test rigs. Yeah, I kind of became a bit lazy the last, I guess, two years because I always... Compiling firmware was a pain for me, so I kind of was very happy with uh, my Duet boards, RepRep firmware, and also Clipper. But yeah. I think you're you're also trying to make the compilation process and things like that way easier so this might be a good opportunity to get back to marlin yeah i made auto build marlin just for that reason is just it's otherwise you have to go through this long list of and know exactly which environment you're supposed to ch choose to build with yeah. platform io is this you know behemoth of a thing and like it makes things a lot easier for us we do a lot of like scripting behind the scenes so it only builds mm. the files that you need for your build which makes the build go by like you know typically a uh, build is like under a minute and mm. and then the next build is 10 seconds so it's like but i just wanted to make a nice interface to make it, the building easier which is why i added the auto build marlin uh but hopefully we'll we'll continue to work on that and make it easier to like configure and build and also migration is also a big challenge for people. So I can understand that frustration, but I hope I'll make things easier for, uh, for everyone and that it won't, we won't be scaring people away with the build process anymore. No, not at all. Yeah, it's, it was really interesting to hear more a bit what's going on like behind the curtain and also kind of your insights on, on open source. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. like that. Um, so yeah, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank really you for appreciate having me. It. Yeah, it's been great. All right, and if people want to support Marlin, we're gonna put all the links uh, down to your patron in the uh, what's it called, Stefan? You usually do this. Show notes. Show notes. Yes, it's not the video <laughs> description, but if you watch it yeah. on YouTube, it is also the video, the video description. description. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking head at Patreon and also at GitHub. So, g getting back to uh, Scott's 
suggestion in the first couple of minutes if you're running a Marlin printer <laughs> maybe just donate one dollar for each printer to Scott <laughs> and throw let's see buck. if he's gonna be, yeah th throw him Buy a buck a coffee. Uh, yeah he's he's making he, he kind of got us there where we are today and uh, I think we all should appreciate that um, so yeah, if you thank can you, everyone. support open source work I think it's it might it, it might not be like the most sustainable. Let's what's just the stop alternative? Right <laughs> yeah, what's what are you the alternative? Use otherwise, you know. Yeah, um, exactly. No, it's all open source now, so here we are. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and take care, I'm guys. getting tired. It's already <laughs> late right here in Germany. Yeah, I'm feeling take that. <laughs> it looks like bright daylight where Tom is. He's got that artificial sun going. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's always in the basement. He never knows if it's day or night or thunderstorm I, I or will no. I will yeah. Know. Just like a Las Vegas casino. So exactly. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks again uh, for your time, Scott, and thanks again for your time, Stefan. Um, thanks everyone for watching and listening, and we will see you all in the next one. And yeah. Happy bye making, bye. everybody. Happy making. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>